إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات عمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد الحمد لله we have reached the 13th of Sha'ban on a Wednesday, Alhamdulillah, 1443. And Alhamdulillah, we're going to be looking at today the continuation where we left off at in discussing the key matters that distinguish the school of Imam Ahmed and continue to be the reason why it is as dominant as it is and why it is used for day-to-day -day affairs, judgments, jihad, and the like. So as is usual, the quote, close quote system is in effect. And the Sheikh Mustafa Hamdu Ulayan, he says, quote, وكان الإمام أحمد وكان الإمام أحمد بن حنبل يرى الوضوء من الحجامة والرعاء فقيل له فإن كان الإمام قد خرج منه الدم ولم يتوضأ تصلي خلفه فقال كيف أصلي خلف سعيد بن مسيب مالك and the Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal used to hold the position that one should make wudu after hijama and operation it was said to him so if there was the case that the Imam came out and he had some blood that it came forth from the operation or the hijama, the cupping, and he had not made wudu. Would you pray behind him? He said, how could I not pray behind Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib and Malik ibn Anas? And this is taken from Al-Fatah al-Kubra, Ibn Taymiyyah, Al-Mujall al-Thani, Al-Sufha, 17 wa 300. And this is taken from Al-Fatah al-Kubra by Taqi ibn Taymiyyah, Volume 2, page 317, close quote. What this is talking about is that if there's a difference of opinion, that when it's a valid difference of opinion, he has no problem accepting that. But it's his position for the school that indeed these things, they nullify the wudu. But if someone does not have that as their position, then it does not. And this is another thing that is extremely important. Other people go to great lengths within other schools to find out what the other school has that nullifies and if it nullifies but it's not nullified in their school or if it doesn't nullify but it nullifies in their school then all of a sudden they can't pray behind them but in the school of Imam Ahmed rahimahullah our understanding is we pray behind each and every individual as long as that matter is not nullified according to them so if it's not a nullifier according to that person that's leading the salah and it's coming from uh, the first three generations and sound text that's been handed down, then it doesn't matter whether it's nullified to us. It matter, what matters is nullified to him because he's the imam leading the salah. And this is why you'll find that in the Masjid al-Haram, uh, Masjid al-Nabawi, the Dome of the Rock, al-Aqsa, that's the amul that's been held throughout Arabia, the Gulf, um, much of Iraq and much of Syria, that's the way that it's had to be simply because that's the only way to get things done with regards to Salah and other things because to use the other methodology would simply be censurious and cause an incredible amount of fitin. So, uh, Sheikh Mustafa, he continues on by saying, quote, قال أبو بكر الخلال أخبرني الحسين بن بشار المخرمي قال سألت أحمد بن حنبل عن مسألة في الطلاق فقال إن فعل حنث فقلت يا أبا عبد الله أكتب لي بخطك فكتب فكتب لي في ظهر رقعة قال أبو عبد الله إن فعل حنث قلت يا أبا عبد الله إن أفتاني إنسان يعني أن لا ينحث فقال أحمد لي تعرف حلقة المدنيين قلت نعم فإن فإن أفتوني يدخل قال نعم وهذا ما صار عليه أئمة الحنابلة ومنهم مفتي الحنابلة في زمانه الشيخ العلامة محمد بن عبد الله بن فيروز الأحزائي رحمه الله حيث قضاء في مسألة عرضت عليه أن مذهب الحنابلة فيها أن يتعين إحالتها إلى فقه مالكي 
يقضي فيها لأنه مذهب الغالب الذي جرى به عرف البلد and Abu Bakr al-Khalal said it was informed I was informed by Al-Husayn ibn Bashar al-Mukharrimi who said I asked Ahmed ibn Hanbal about a point in the issue of talaq and he said if such and such did that then indeed he has broken his oath and caused the talaq to come into effect I said uh, but Abu Abdullah, could you write that down for me in your handwriting? So he wrote it down so that I had that on a piece of vellum paper for uh, on a sheet of vellum. And I and which read Abu Abdullah has said if such and such was done, then indeed it brings about the talaq and breaks the oath. I said to him, Abu Abdullah, if he gives if someone gave me a ruling that it didn't, then what do I do about that? Imam Ahmed said, well, as for me, you know the ruling of the people of Al Medina, don't you? I said, yes. And if it's other than their ruling, then we still follow it. Yes? Yes. So then that as well as my ruling. If it's different to us, we accept that and we differ with them, but we accept their ruling. And this is collected in Tabaqat al Hanabil al Mujal al Awal, al Sufha al Rabauna wa Mia. طبقات الحنابلة volume 1 page 140 وهذا ما سار عليه إمة الحنابلة ومنهم and this is the way of tolerance that the imams of the Hanbalis followed ومنهم مفتي الحنابلة في زمانه and amongst those tolerant imams that we see is the mufti of the Hanbalis in his time the sheikh the senior scholar Muhammad Abdullah ibn Fayruz al-Ahsai رحمه الله when he gave a ruling on a particular point that was brought to him regarding the Hanbali madhab that was very specific on a matter, but then he turned it over to a Maliki Faqih in order to give the ruling in the Maliki Madhab because the particular area that Al Imam Al Ahsai was in had as its dominant group the Maliki Madhab. Thalithan, the third heading of distinguishing characteristics. Prohibition of stacking together several dispensations and affairs. وَلَا يَعْنِي سَعَةَ الْمَذْهَبِ وَيُسْرُهُ التَّرَخُّصِ وَتَسَاهُلْ فِي أَحْكَامِ شَرِيعَةِ فَالْإِمَامُ أَحْمَدْ نَهَا عَنْ تَتَبِعُ الرُّخَصِ الَّتِي قَالَ بِهَا الْعُلَمَاءِ لِأَنَّ مَنْ تَتَبِعُ الرُّخَصِ الْعُلَمَاءِ تَزَنْدَقَ قال ابن النجار فتوحي في شرح كوكب المنير الصفحة 77 و 500 ويحرم على العام تتبع رخص وهو أنه كلما وجد رخصة في مذهب عمل بها عمل بها, عمل بها ولا يعمل بغيرها في ذلك المذهب ويفسق بتتبع الرخص لأنه لا يقول بإهباحة جميع الرخص أحد من علماء المسلمين So just because it's been mentioned the vastness and the ease of the Hanbali school this does not mean that one just takes dispensation after dispensation to the point to where they cause laziness and ease uh, to the degree of, la of lacklusterness in the judgments of the revealed law Know for a surety that the Imam Ahmed forbade from stacking together dispensations which the scholars had spoken of because whoever stacks together and follows up a number of dispensations of the scholars has indeed committed Zandaqa, which is a type of apostasy. Imam Ibn Najjar al Futuhi, who died 972 Hijri Rahimahullah, said in his Sharhu Kokabu Munir, volume, uh, Sharhu Kokabu Munir, page 577. It is impermissible for the common man to stack together dispensations, which is where he would find a dispensation in one method and act by that, but then not then act but not act by it in other circumstances in that same method in which he's gathering together many things without understanding what it is. This is incorrect. Such a one commits rebellious sin, fisk, by stacking together dispensations because he is not standing by this affair correctly. And no one ever spoke of all of the dispensations being stacked together from any of the Imams of the Muslims. So after this point that Al Fatuhi had made, we should then understand the following. That our Imam forbade from excessive moving around for dispensations in the revealed law of Allah. فَقَدْ قَالَ أَبُوْ دَوُودِ يعني السجستاني في المسائل أبو داود السجستاني said in المسائل رحمه الله الصفحة 
ثمانيه وستونه وثلاثمئه on page 368 عنه انه which in which the following was said ذكر الحيلاء من امر اصحاب الراي فقال يحتالون لنقض سنن الرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وكان يعجب مما يقولون في الحيل في الايمان في الايمان ويبطلون الايمان بالحيل وقال الله تعالى ولا تنقض الايمان بعد توكي توكيدها it was mentioned that putting together several rulings of dispensation is from the way of the people of opinion and in addition to this they put together all these things in a way in which the sunan of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam might be laid bare and brought to nothing and they're actually happy and joyous by what they do in which they do this in oaths by nullifying oaths when allah told them and do not nullify the oaths after they've been solemnized surah an-nahl the 16th surah ayah 91 wa rawa ibn hu salih fi al-masail and his eldest son salih al-baghdadi said in al-masail al-mujaddid al-thalith as-sufha 30 wa 100 volume 3 page 130 annahu qaal that imam ahmed said al-hiyal la naraha the stacking together of different rulings in several different things at once we do not hold this understanding wa hadhihi al-hiyal muharramatun siwa أن كانت في العبادات والبيوع معاملات ومناكحات فإن الإنسان قد يمكث سنوات من عمره وهو يخادع الله والمؤمنين ثم لا يجد نفسه على شيء فتكون صلاته رك أو زكاته وزواجه وبيعه وشراءه قائمة على باطل وما بني على باطل فهو باطل الإمام أحمد said as quoted from his son stacking together several rulings would not hold this position from this quote taken from Ahmed, I would like to say that these stacked together rulings are impermissible, whether they were in acts of worship, transactions, buying and selling, divorce and marriage, because the human being remains many years of his life doing these things to the degree that he seeks to deceive Allah and the believers. Then after a period of time, he doesn't find himself on anything. And what this does is that his salah, zakah, marriage, buying, selling, renting is all established on something that's false and nullified. And anything built on something false and nullified is in and of itself nullified. وَيُنْمَنِي عَلَى ذَلِكَ مَسَاءَ كَثِيرًا مِنْهَا عَدَمُ السِّحَةِ النِّكَاحِ الْمُحَلَّلِ وَبِعَ الْعِينَ وَعَدَمُ السَّقُوتِ الشَّفَعَ بِالْحِيلَةِ عَلَى إِبْطَالِهَا وَعَدَمُ حَلَّ الْخَمْرِ بِتَخْلِيلِهَا عِلَاجٍ and this type of stacking in this issue is many where people throw things together an example of that is the impermissibility of the nikah that involves a man who marries a woman in order to have sexual intercourse with her when she's been three times divorced that will allow her after that marriage where he divorces her in a sham to go back with the first husband or selling an ina in which is a type of trade in which someone uses something that is close to riba in a transaction or having someone intercede in a transaction in order to nullify it and to stop someone else from having the same intercession and transaction or the impermissibility of wine or the like by converting it over to vinegar for medicine. And this was mentioned by Ibn al-Najjar and others. قال ابن قدامة في المغني and Imam Wafi ibn Qudama has said in al-Mughni والحيلة كلها محرمة لا يجوز في شيء من الدين وهو أن يظهر عقدا مباحا يريدان به محرمة مخادعة وتوصلا إلا فعل إلا 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 فعل ما حرم الله تعالى واستباح محظوراته أو إسقاط واجب أو دفع حق ونحو ذلك. And this was mentioned that stacking together all of these things, gathering together all these different affairs, is impermissible. It's not permitted in all in the religion. 
And this leads to manifesting a permitted transaction, but seeking to do something impermissible by taking several permitted things and putting them together. This is a means of deception and a means to doing something that Allah has forbidden, exalted be he, bringing about making permitted that which he has forbidden in any of the, any ways whatsoever, causing, trying to lay waste to that which is wajib in order to do something that is impermissible or removing someone's right from him and similar, similar wicked things as this. قال أيوب السختياني رحمه الله الإمام the Imam أيوب السختياني may Allah have mercy upon him said إنهم ليخادعون الله تعالى كما يخادعون الصبي لو كانوا يأتون الأمر على وجهه كان أسهل عليه because these people they seek to deceive Allah exalted be He just as they seek to deceive a small child is as if they were coming to an affair in one way. But they were trying to find an easier way to trick someone like me in order to sneak a ruling. Rabi'an, of the distinguishing characteristics of the school. Restricting rulings that have to do with the common good to affairs that are within the boundaries of the revealed law. So as not to be corrupted. Some of the contemporary scholars when giving rulings have made things far too vast according to what they see of what's referred to as common good. But Hanbalis limit this chapter very much based upon the fact that opening a door such as this could be dangerous to the revealed law. And this has been stipulated by the senior scholar Al-Murdawi in his text at Tahbir, Sharh al-Tahrir, volume 7, pages, page 1933. And this particular well-being is not viewed as a proof in and of itself and must be limited. And this position is opposite to Imam Malik and to some of the Shafi's. وقال في الشرح أن إن كامنتريز منشن اختلف العلماء في هذه المصلحة وتسمى مصلحة مصلحة المرسلة. The scholars have differed in this particular form of public good or common good, and sometimes called the facilitation of common good. فذهب الأكثر إلى أنها ليست بحجة. But most have held the position that is not a proof in and of itself. قال ابن قدامة في الروضة والصحيح أنها ليست بحجة. He mentioned روضة الناظر Mu'afir al-Din al-Qudama that the authentic position is that it's not a proof in of itself from the usul. Qala ibn Muflih al-Maqdisi, Imam ibn Muflih al-Maqdisi rahimahullah Shams al-Din has said, فَلَيْسَ هَذِي الْمَصْلَحَ بِحُجَّةٍ خِلَافَ لِمَالِكَ وَبَعْضِ الشَّيْفِعِيَةِ So the maslaha al-Mursala is not a hujjah from the usul in and of itself, and this is in distinction to the dispute between, with Malik and some of the Shafi's. <coughs> وقد اعتبر الموافق يعني موافق دين القدامة أن الحكم يجرر المقاصد المصالح هو حكم بالعقل مجرد. This is because موافق دين القدامة رحمه الله has expressed that the ruling given merely for common good or certain aims is a ruling based merely on the intellect. ورد على قول خطير المحكي عن الإمام مالك رحمه الله ولا يصح نقله عنه. And this rebukes. This is a rebuke on the on the dangerous statement attributed to Imam Malik rahimahullah, which is not authentically narrated to him regarding the intellect. فقال موافق دين القدامى رحمه الله في روضة الناظر الصفحة أربعة وثمانون وأربعمية. أن يوم موافق دين القدامى رحمه الله mentioned in his روضة الناظر page four eight four the following كان أي الحكم بالمصالح. Thus, the ruling with the common good. وضعاً للشرع بالرأي. What this does is it lays down something in the revealed law according to opinion. وحكماً بالعقل المجرد. And gives a ruling according to just pure intellect. كما حكى أن مالك قال يجوز قتل الثلث من الخلق لاستلاح الثلثين. Just as has been 
uh, supposedly narrated that Imam Malik rahimahullah said, it's permitted to kill a third of humanity in order for the safeguarding and public good of two thirds. We don't know anyone and anything in the revealed law that is preservation of the public good according to this methodology. And there is nothing stipulated like this at all. Khamisan, the fifth of the distinguishing characteristics. Yusuf al Madhab al Hanbali fi Baba Ahkam al Nisa. The ease of the Hanbali Madhab in the subject of the rulings regarding ladies. Laysa maqsudi huna naqla mu'atamid fil Madhabi wa inna izhar ma tafarrad bihi al Madhab wa law fi riwayatin aw wajhin كما فعل أبو الخطاب الكلوذاني في الانتصار وغيره من 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 علماء المذهب والمقدسي في منظومته في المفردات. My intent in stating these things here is not just to narrate the Mu'tamid in the Madhab; it is only to manifest also what the Madhab is set apart with, even if it's a narrative or one ruling, as was done by Abu Abu Khattab al Kalwadani who died 513 in his Al-Intisar, and other scholars from the senior scholars of the Madhab and Al-Maqdisi in his Mandumat. من دلائل ساعة المذهب وتيسيره أنه حين أراد القانون المصري التعديل في بعض في بعض المواد الخاصة من المرأة لم يجد ما يسد رمقه ويلبي حاجته إلا في المذهب الحنبلي. One of the indicators of the vastness of the madhab and its ease is that when the time came to lay down a reform of the Egyptian legal code of justice in one of the recent epochs of history with regards to women in particular, they didn't find anything more clear and more easy except in the Hanbali madhab, which came to be relied upon. Close quote. Now, this is referring to before the monarchy uh, came to an end and the British expressed control over it. And you had Senhuri and others uh, devise a law code for the Arab world that when it came to the law codes in Egypt up until the collapse of the monarchy, which had been brought in by Muhammad Ali Basha through the um, he was sort of a uh, a Hanafi warlord that came from Macedonia, broke off from the Ottomans pulled Egypt out of out of Ottoman control and created his own structure. And out of that came Fuad the first and then out of him came Farouk the first. So these were kings, Albanian kings. And the, the reform that they did to the laws to try to ease things up for, for women because there were a lot of the laws around women that there were struggles with and issues for mobility as well as other rulings around custody. And what they did is they wound up falling back on the Mu'atamid of the school of Yom Ahmed that they borrowed from the Gulf as well as Iraq and Sham. And so this was before the communist takeover and also before the suzerainty under the British. So Sheikh Ulayan he goes on to say, quote, وَأَمَّا إِنْ صَافِ لِمَمُ أَحْمَلُ الْمَرَأَةِ فَهُوَ مَأْخُوذٌ مِنْ فَهْمِهِ لِرُوحِ النُّصُوصِ فَالنِّسَاءُ شَقَائِقُ الرِّجَالِ وَقَدْ أَوْصَى النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ بِهِنَّ وَهَذِي بَعْضُ مَسَائِلَ فِي ذَلِكَ هل المرأة أن تشترط ألا يتزوج عليها؟ So Imam Ahmed, the Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal proposed a level of equity for women in which it was taken from his understanding of the very essence of the explicit text of the revealed law. The reason being that in the Hadith, women are the shaqaiq, the twin halves of men. And the Prophet ﷺ gave specific directives regarding how they are to be safe, safeguarded and cared for. And here are some of these issues that are referred to. One of them is, is it for the woman that she can make a condition that a man may not marry another wife if he is married to her? And this be stipulated in the marriage contract. قال الكوسج امرأة اشترطت على الرجل عند عقدة النكاح أن لا يتزوج علي ولا تتسر ولا تخرجني من داري. الكوسج said a woman may condition on the man at the in the marriage contract that he may not marry anyone while she is with him, whether it be a free wife or slave wife, nor sh- nor may he expel her from the marital home during their marriage. قال الإمام أحمد محمد هذه الشروط كلها لها. The Imam Ahmed Rahimullah said, all of these conditions 
stand firm and they're for her and they're valid فإن تزوج أو تصر فهي مخيرة فإن شاءت قامت معه وإن وإن شاءت فارق 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 فارقته قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إن حق شروط أن يوفى به وما استحللتم به الفروج قال إسحاق ما قال and likewise if he married a free woman or a slave woman then she has the choice if she so so wills she can stand with him in the marriage but if she so wills she may فرقته, she may uh, leave him uh, through divorce or dissolution of the marriage as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the the conditions that have the most right that they be fulfilled is those in which the women are made permitted for you in marriage and as haqim rahway has said this is indeed just as the imam had quoted مسألة الكوسج المسألة ثلاثة وخمسون وألف and this is taken from مسألة الكوسج مسألة number 1053 وذهب إلى العدم وجوب تغطية الوجه على الصحيح من المذهب وهو ما قرر المرداوي في الإنصاف قال ابن مفلح في كتابه الأداب الشرعية المجلل الأول الصفحة ثلاثة عشر وستمائة ما نصه هل يسوغ الانكار على النساء إلى جانب إذا كشفنا وجوههن في الطريق ينبغي الجواب على أن المرأة هل يجب عليها ستر وجهها ويجب غض النظر نظر عنها وفي مسألة قولان قال, قال القاضي عياض في حديث جرير رضي الله عنه قال سألت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عن النظر فجاء فأمرني أن أصرف بصري رواه مسلم قال العلماء رحمهم الله تعالى وفي هذا حجة على أنه لا يجد على المرأة أن تسترى وجهها في طريقها وإنما ذلك سنة مستحبة لها ويجب على الرجل غض البصر عنها وفي جميع الأحوال إلا لغرض شرعي ذكره الشيخ محي الدين النووي ولم يزد عليه So Imam Ahmed went to the position that the face of the woman is not counted as awra according to the sahih position from the madhim. And it is what has been established by al-Mardawi in al-Insaf. It was also mentioned by Shams al-Din al maqdisi in his book Al-Adab al sharia uh, volume 1, page 613, in which the text we'll be reading in a moment before we explain what another sheikh has mentioned. قال الشيخنا الشيخ إسماعيل ابن بدران الدومي رحمه الله our شيخ شيخ إسماعيل ابن بدران الدومي رحمه الله حفظه الله uh, he said in a footnote بل يجب تغطيته لورود الأدلة والنصوص بذلك uh, in fact it is necessary that she veil her face as it is indeed عورة due to the texts and explicit texts in that regard قلت, I, the author, Mustafa Hamdu Uliyan, would like to say, في المسألة خلاف في المذهب كما لا يخفى على فضيلتكم. You should understand that there is a difference of opinion about whether the face is awra or not in the madhab, as is clear to all. قال ابن قدامة في المغني, as موافق ابن قدامة رحمه الله المغني has said, المجلد السابع صفحة اثنان ومية, volume 7, page 102 of the Mughni, فأما نظر الرجل الأجنبية من غير سبب فإنه محرم لجميعها في ظاهر كلام أحمد قال أحمد لا يأكل مع مطلقته هو أجنبي لا يحل له أن ينظر إليها كيف يأكل معها وينظر إلى كفها لا يحل له ذلك وقال القاضي يحرم عليه النظر إلى ما عاد الوجه والكفين لأنه عورة ويباح له النظر إليها ما كراهة إذا أمن الفتنة ونظر لغير شهوة وهذا مذهب الشافعي لقوله تعالى لا يبدين زينتهن إلا ما ظهر منها وقال ابن عباس الوجه والكفين وروت عائشة رضي الله عنها أن أسماء بنت أبي بكر دخلت على الرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في ثياب رقاق فعرض عنها وقال يا أسماء إن المرأة إذا بلغت المحيط لا يصلح أن يرى, أن يرى منها إلا هذا وهذا وإشار إلى وجهه وكفيه وروى أبو بكر وغيره ولأنه ليس بعورة ولم يحرم النظر إلى 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 بغير ريبة كوجه الرجل ولنا قوله تعالى وإذا سألتموهن متاع فسألوهن من وراء عجاب وقال في الإنصاف 
وقوله هو الحرة كلها عورة حتى ظفرها وشعرها إلى الوجه أصحيح من المذهب أن الوجه ليس بعورة وعليه أصحاب وحكاوة القاضي بإجماع وعنه الوجه عورتها أيضا وقال الزركشي أطلق الإمام أحمد القول بأن جميعها عورة وهو محمول على أن ما عاد الوجه أو على غير الصلاة And thus Al-Muafqin al-Qadam rahimahullah said As far as the man looking to a woman that is a stranger to him without a reason then this is impermissible that he look at all of her in totality and this is the dominant and apparent position of the Imam Ahmed Hanbal Imam Ahmed Rahimullah said he should not eat with his divorced wife she is now a stranger to him it's not permitted that he look at her how can he eat with her and he's looking at her looking at her in her hands and the like it's not permitted that Al-Qadibu Ya'la al-Baghdadi rahimahullah said, it's impermissible for the man to look to whatever is besides the face and the hands of the woman because it is awrah. It's permitted that he look at her while it was disliked, even when it's free from tribulation and fitna. And even when he's looking without desire. And this is also the method of Imam Shafi'i based upon the understanding of the ayah where Allah exalted be, he said, and what appears and and they should not reveal their finery except what appear, what is apparent of it. Surah Al Nur, the twenty fourth surah, thirty one. Ibn Abbas radhiyallahu anhu said that makes reference to the face and the two hands. Aisha narrated that Asma bint Abi Bakr came into the presence of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in thin clothing once, and he turned away and recoiled from her, and he said, Asma, the woman when she's reached the age where she has her cycle, it's not right that you see anything of her except this and this. And he pointed to his face and hands. And this is collected by Abu Bakr ibn Abdul Aziz and others besides. And this is because they are not awrah. Therefore, it's not impermissible to look at them without any doubt, like the face of the man. However, our position, Muafud ibn Qadama has said, is a statement of Allah when you ask them for anything or any need, then ask them from behind a curtain. Surah Al-Hazab, the 33rd Surah 53. It's mentioned, it's been mentioned in Al-Insaf, volume one, page four, five, three, the statement, the free woman, all of her is aura, even her nail, her hair, except the face. The, this is the authentic position from the Madhab that the face is not aura. And this is the position of the, of the companions of the school. This was, and it was narrated that Al-Qadda said that this is consensus. There is another ruling though from Imam Ahmed that it is indeed aura. Imam Badr al-Din Zirakashi rahimahullah said, the Imam stated uh, categorically that all of her is awrah, but this bears on the understanding that whatever is besides the face or outside of the salah, and this is the matter that is the ruling to be kept. Close quote. Now what this makes reference to is the difference of the school and why the woman's uh, face is covered and why it's not. Is it awrah or is it not? Because there's different reasons, there's two different understandings. Some say that the face is aura, therefore it must be covered. Some say no, the face is not aura, but it should be covered. And there's reasons, and what your position is on the matter of whether it's aura or not will affect the circumstances of when it is licit for it to be uncovered, which this is not the time to discuss all of this. So we'll return back to the text of the Imam. He kind of gave this this really good nugget, mashallah. This is beautiful stuff. I remember um, I haven't read some of this in like 17 years, some of these like Masail about awrah or non awrah It really uh, brings back a lot of good memories, mashallah. But we'll look at what um, the Imam has said, just keeping in mind that point that this discussion is kind of hemmed in with the uh, dispute about whether it's Aura or not aura, because that's going to affect the circumstances of when it can and cannot be uncovered. Thus, Shamsuddin al Muflih, the Imam says, Shamsuddin al Muflih, rahimahullah, said in Al Adab al Sharia, volume 1, page 613. So, is it valid for one to repudiate uh, strange women when they reveal their faces when going out on the pathways? It's necessary to answer that the woman. Is it necessary for her to veil her face or is it necessary for the man to lower his gaze from her when she's walking on the pathway of her own? The issue has two statements. Al-Qadr Iyad rahimahullah answered regarding the hadith of Jirir radiallahu anhu. 
in which it was said that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was asked by him regarding the regarding the sudden look or the accidental look. He ordered me in that circumstance that I turned my face away. And this is collected by my Muslim. The scholars, rahimahumullah ta'ala, may Allah have mercy upon them all, have said, and this is a proof on that it's not necessary for the woman that she veil her face when she's walking down her own world or pathway. That is only a praiseworthy sunnah for her. It's necessary for the man that he lower his gaze from her in all circumstances except for a valid reason in the revealed law. And this has been mentioned by the Sheikh Muhyiddin al Nawawi, and none has increased on that statement besides. So, in this circumstance, is repudiation to be done? So on this, then we have to ask, so is repudiation in this circumstance mandated? It's necessary for the repudiation to be subjected to the principles of dispute and difference of opinion because we've already discussed this before. Now, as far as our understanding and the statement of a group of Shefri scholars and others that looking to a woman that's a stranger to one and not from one's near relatives is permitted when there's no desire present and when one is not alone with such a one. And this is the end of the statement of Imam Ibn Muflih. Qultu, I would like to say, Mustafa Hamdu Ulayyan, ولو كان عرف البلد تغطية الوجه فيجب العمل بالعرف خشية الفتنة وانتشار المفاسد لأن الفتنة تبدأ شبرا وتنتهي بعا. Now, in the case where covering the face is the norm in all cases, then it's compulsory to act by that action out of fear of tribulation and spreading corruption because tribulations start with a hand span and then become one bow's length before you know it. وَذَهَبَ إِلَى كِرَاهَةِ الزَّوَاجِ الْعَجُوزِ مِنَ الصغيرة. And he went to the position, Imam Ahmed held the position that it is disliked for the elders to make their children marry when they're young, when the permission, when permission is not established. وَأَمَّا النَّظْرُ بِالطَّلَاقِ قَدْ سُئِلَ الْإِمَامُ أَحْمَدَ عَنْ رَجُلِ النَّظْرَ أَنْ يُطَلِّقُ أَمْرَأَتَ فَقَالَ لَا, لا يُطَلِّقْ وَيُكَفِّرُ قيل له هو معصية قال وأي شيء من المعصية أكثر من الطلاق إذا طلقها فقد أهلكها As far as the oath someone who's taken a vow to make talaq upon his wife Imam Ahmed was asked about that A man had made an oath that he would a man had made a vow that he would make talaq upon his wife He said لا يطلق ولا يكفر He does not make talaq upon his wife and he doesn't have to expiate that oath it was said to him, but wait a minute, isn't that disobedience? He said, which thing is a greater disobedience than talaq? Because when this man gives her talaq for this reason, he's destroyed her. Ar-riwayatain wal wajhain. And this is taken from Ar-riwayatain wal wajhain. Al-mujallu thani as-subha arba wa arba'una wa mi'a. This is taken from Ar-riwayatain and Al-wajhain, volume 2, page 144. وقال عن طلاق الوالدين ولا يزمه أن يطلقها على معنى الإيجاب لأن طلاق المرأة الصالحة ليس من بر الوالدين في شيء. He also mentioned about the parents commanding the child to make talaq upon the wife. He said such a thing is not required because it is not wajib because pronouncing talaq upon a pious woman is not from showing righteousness to one's parents at all. Masal al Kausaj al Mujal al Rabi' al Sufha Tis'a wa Ishruna wa Sabamiya wa Alf. And this is from Masal al Kausaj, volume 4, page 1729. Wa Khadrad al Imamu Ahmadu Alaman Estadella Ali hi bitatliki Omar al Zojati ibn Fakala Hatta Yakuna Abuki Omar. And he actually repudiated the one who sought to use his evidence for divorcing uh, one's child because of the incident of Omar commanding his son to divorce his wife, he said, oh, so is your father like Omar where he has that type of right and that type of command and righteousness? 
وذهب إلى جواز أن يجعل الرجل الطلاق بيد زوجته وذهب إلى أن الأولى الاقتصار على زوجة واحدة إلا إذا لم تعفه وخشى من الوقوع في الزنا فله أن يتزوج وفي ذلك يحفظ حق الرجل والمرأة Imam Ahmed also went to the position of the permissibility that the man should allow talaq to pass to the hand of the woman for use. And he went to the position that it is more praiseworthy that the man should limit himself to one wife except when he will not be able to maintain his chastity and feared falling into either fornication or adultery. In such a case such as that, then he marries more than one. And in this matter, one preserves the right of the husband as well as the wife. And he gave permission for the woman that she might go out for her basic needs and that the man is required to give her maintenance within the marriage. And if he should fall short in that regard, she has a right to seek talaq. And the man may not physically discipline his wife except if she left the fara'id. By that is meant as-salawat al-khams, the five salahs. وَقَدْ سَأَلَ الشَّالِنْجِي عَمَّا يَجُوزُ ضَرَبَ الْمَرْأَ عَلِيهَا And so al-shalinji was asked regarding when is it permitted for the husband to use uh, phys- physical discipline on his wife. فَقَالَ عَلَى تَرْكِ فَرَاعَدِ اللَّهِ وَيَضْرِبُهَا ضَرْبًا رَفِيقًا غَيْرُ مُبَرِّحٍ To which he said, uh, if she leaves the five salawat that Allah has stipulated, he disciplines her with light strikes which are غَيْرُ مُبَرِّحٍ which leave no marks. And this is taken from a mughni by Muafid al-Qudama. Close quote. So what this refers to is, the, because this is not a had, it's not a judicial punishment, it's what's known as a ta'zir, it's a precautionary measure, which means that it has to be on the front or back of the hands, front and back of the feet, or the buttocks, and it can't be over more than 10 stripes, because if it's more than 10 stripes, it's a had, because the Rasul said, anything over 10 swats or strikes is a had, and as there, there's no head for this listed, so therefore, it can only be a ta'zir, a judiciary matter, a, 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 a precautionary measure. Now we return back to the statement of the Sheikh Mustafa Hamdul Ulayyan. وَذَهَبَ إِلَىٰ أَنَّ لِلْمَرَأَةِ حَقُّ الْفَسْخِ وَالطَّلَاقِ إِذَا كَانَ زَوْجُهَا يَضْرِبُهَا بَلَا سَبَبًا أَوْ كَانَ بِهِ جُنُونٌ أَوْ وَسْوَاسٌ he also went to the position, Imam Ahmed also held the position that the woman has the right to have the marriage dissolved or talaq when her husband has struck her without reason or he is insane or suffers from deep whisperings of the shaitan and this was not divulged in the beginning. وَذَهَبَ إِلَّا أَنَّ كَسْبَ الْمَرْأَ لَهَا قَالَ حَرْبٌ إِسْمَعِيلُ الْكَرْمَانِ سَأَلْتُ أَحْمَدَ عَنْ كَسْبَ الْمَرْأَ قَالَ لَهَا He also went to the position that the woman's earnings do indeed belong to her. As Harb ibn Ismail al-Karmani radiallahu anhu asked Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala wa radiallahu anhu wa radha regarding the earning of the woman to which he said that's her earnings. وَذَهَبَ إِلَىٰ إِنَّ لَهَا حَقُ الْحِضَانَ فَقَالَ الْأُمْ أَعْطَى عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَىٰ السَّبْعَةِ فَيُخَيِّرُونَ He also went to the position that she has custody of the child until seven years of age and he said the mother is more tender towards those children up until seven, then after that point they make the choice of where they so desire to live. وقال أحمد في رواية حنبل بن إسحاق رضي الله عنهما لبأس أن ينظر إليها وإلى ما يدعوه إلى نكاحها من يد أو جسم أو نحو ذلك وصحيح من المذهب كما قال المرضوي والمعمول به في الفتوى كما في المنتهى العراضات المجلد الثاني الصفحة السبعة وعشرون وستمية وكشف القناع المجلد الخامس الصفحة العاشرة جواز النظر المخاطب يلا ما يظهر عادة من المرأة كوجه ويد ورقبة وقدم وهو من مفردات المذهب. And the woman also has the right of choosing the husband, and that she have her permission sought for the marriage, and that she has the right to look at the suitor, and that she has the right 
that she go in front of him according to what she wears of her clothing customarily so that he might see what, what she has and he and she might see what he has. The senior scholar Abu Bakr Abdul Aziz Ghulam al Khalal died 387, Rahimahullah, said, There's no harm that the man look at her at the time of the marriage interview, even if his head is bare, so that he might see, so that she might see himself, her, him, him in his natural environment. And Imam Ahmed said in one narrative from Hanbal ibn Ishaq, Rahimahullah, there's no harm that he look at her and to what normally appears from her, uh, from the nikah regarding her hand the shape of her body, and similar to that. The authentic position from the madhab is just as what's been mentioned by Imam uh, Alauddin al-Mardawi, who died 885, and the acted upon position in fatwa is just as what has been mentioned by Imam al-Fatuhi in Muntaha al radad volume 2, page 627, as well as Imam Buhuti, rahimahullah, who died 1051, and Kashaf al volume 5, page 10, of the permissibility of the suitor looking at what appears customarily of the woman in her daily chores, such as the face, hand, neck, feet, and such. And this is from the peculiar characteristics of the medheb. And these are the affairs that are permitted that one may take examination of. Of al medheb al-jawaz al-khuruj al-mar'a mu'atadda li hajatiha wa kasbiha wa qala ibn al-nasri allah radiyu anhu law kanat mu'atadda لا قوت لها إلا من كسبها مضاعة تعمنها خارج بيتها فهل لها ذلك أي الخروج لم يصرح به وهذا المفهوم يشعر بجواز ذلك قاله في حاشة المغني and in the madhab is the permissibility of the woman that is in her idda her waiting period upon the death of her husband or the like to head out for her daily needs as well as earnings for work Ibn Asr Allah had said if she was in her waiting period and had no other means of detecting nourishment for her except from earning her daily her daily means by going out, she works outside of her home. And now the question is, is in the event that that has to happen, she has to go out. Is that mentioned explicitly in texts? He said the scholars of the school did not explicitly mention this in texts, but it is understood from examination of the text and examination of the quotes on the topic when you examine uh, the topic in question. And this is mentioned in his Hasha on al Mughni, and this is taken from Hashid ibn Awad, Al Dalil, Al Mujalla Thani, Al Sufha, Arba, Wa Situna, Wa Miyatan. And this is taken from the Hashi of Ibn Awad, who died uh, 1195 uh, on the Dalil, volume 2, page 264. وفي المذهب وجوب أن يبذل الرجل زوجته ما اعتدته كالقهوة عملا بالعرف قال الشيخ عثمان النجدي في هداية الراغب المجلد الثالث الصفحة 72 و 700 وأما القهوة فينبغي وجوبها لمن اعتدتها لعدم غناها عنها عادة وعملا بالعرف أن المذهب is a necessity that the husband at times should serve his wife's needs to pamper her as what is normally given, even if it's in the case of so much as bringing coffee to her as an as a custom. And this was mentioned by the Sheikh Uthman and Najdi in his book, uh, who died 1078, Hijri, who died, who, who in his book, he died to Raghib, volume three, page 772. As far as the coffee in question, it's necessary. Uh, that he bring it to her if that's her custom as a, as a service and a custom amongst them um, so that this might be carried out. And he does this as an action and as a custom among them and as an act of righteousness. Close quote. So this is where we have reached so far in our text, alhamdulillah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us to be able to go through these affairs and examine them in more detail, mashallah. So we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us in this affair, put good in this affair, and make us among those who strive in this affair, and benefit us from the words that were given by the imams, mashallah. And uh, the more detailed affairs, I hope that I was able to do justice, especially the topic of uh, aura, non aura. This It's a much more detailed topic that requires uh, an entirely other discussion, which um, is was 
more that that issue was more pronounced um, some 30 years ago where this had to be discussed. But now I think it's fallen out of favor uh, in reference to other more pressing affairs that have come up. But inshallah, it was uh, very interesting to see that, to come across that and to be able to share that with you. And inshallah, we look forward to sharing with you more from this text, inshallah. So we say, Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika wa ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik innahu ghafurur rahim yuhamir rahimin wa la ilaha illa Allah wassalamu alaykum.